Thank you. So, uh, yeah, I'm, um, I'm a web designer. It was only recently that I've been happy calling myself that. Um, before, I was like, I'm a digital designer or I'm a digital strategist. Web designer was a dirty word for a while. You know, it's like your, your, your best mate's brother's son does it in his bedroom with front page. Um, so, no, I am a, I'm a web designer. Um, I didn't start out being a web designer. I started out wanting to be a book designer. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk today a little bit about, um, about my handbook, which is my uh, kind of set of design principles. Really, that's a really fancy word for a bunch of post-it notes stuck up by my desk that I constantly keep coming back to, and they change and refine and things like that. They're quite practical. So uh, I hope that you know, everybody's kind of groups are getting together their ideas uh, later today. These might be useful. Uh, they might not. But um, so I, I run a little design studio, um, and we work with people like CERN um, and Al Jazeera and ESPN, and uh, we work with David on the, the Hyatt Denim uh, site. So we're very broad, very interesting. Uh, I, I run it with my wife, um, which is very interesting. Uh, and no, it is, she's great. That's on film. Um, <laughs> So, uh, so me, um, let me tell you a little bit about me. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you two things that are kind of transformative, I guess. Um, when I was, I'm pretty conventional childhood, I guess. Um, my dad's an architect. Are there any other uh, sons or daughters of architects? Right. <laughs> We're going to commiserate over a beer later. Um, so the, the thing about being an architect's son or daughter is that it can... They can kind of ruin your life in, in some way. Um, and my, my dad's done this to me. So an, an example of this was a couple of years ago in Paris. We went on a family holiday. Um, and I, I was out all day at this conference, family holiday. They went on a family holiday. I went to a conference. Uh, and I came back at the end of the day. And um, I don't know, it's like 8 o'clock at night. The moment I walked through the door, my dad was like, come with me. And we were staying around the corner from the Louvre. And I was like, oh, what's, what? At first, I thought it was something bad had happened. I was like, what, 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 what's happening? And we walked round the Louvre. Like, anyone's been to Paris? The Louvre is massive. It took us like three quarters of an hour to walk around this building. And he's, all the time, he's going, can you see what I'm seeing? I'm like, seriously, I've been at a conference all day, and you're making me trudge around in the freezing cold. Round and round, and he goes, there's no gutters. <laughs> and it's true. Next time you go to the Paris, look around the Louvre. There's no gutters on the Louvre. And he's like, that's bad. What if there's a leak? Where does the water go? So that's one thing. So uh, the, the other thing was uh, last year, um, he's a football fan. He's followed Manchester United like his whole life. Uh, we, we got tickets to see Korea and Japan play in Cardiff Millennium Stadium. A uh, bronze medal grudge match. It was great. Capacity Stadium, 70,000 people. If anyone's ever been to the Millennium Stadium, it's a wonderful stadium. It's really steep. We were right on the last row. So I've never watched football like that. It was fascinating to see the formations. Anyway, we were, we were there. And it's an incredible atmosphere. It's the Olympic Games. And he's looking up like this. I'm like... <laughs> he's like, Mark, Mark. I was like, what? He's like, look at the roof. Look at the roof in this place. It's amazing. I'm like, this is the Olympic Games. What's wrong with you? Uh, so well, so my, my point is, I've, I've grown up with that kind of thing. Uh, I, I've probably stood in more dog shit than all of you combined because my dad would tell me to look up wherever I go. You miss everything in every city at ground level. Everything's the same. All the shops are the same. Everything's the same. Whenever you go anywhere, will be my advice is to walk around like this. You bang into things, you trip over, you step in dog shit. Um, so that's the context in which I kind of grew up. Um, the other thing that really kind of defined me when I was growing up was um, complete and utter failure when I was 18. Uh, I, I did art all the way through school, and for some stupid reason, I decided I wanted to be a scientist. So I did A-level biology, chemistry, and physics. Uh, and completely and miserably and publicly failed them totally. I got, so the, for those of you who don't know, there's like A-levels, the grades are A, B, C, D, E. 
N, U. Uh, I got two N's and a U. I don't know what N means. It's like nearly, not, not quite, an idiot. Like, I was like... So, uh, but the fact is that all my mates were, they all just went off to Cambridge and Oxford, and there's me going, what do I do now? I'm quite good at drawing pictures. Uh, so that's what I did. And I ended up being a designer um, and being the young guy in the studios around about the time the web was really kicking off, I ended up being the web designer. So that's, that's me. I, I, I trained to be a typographic designer, so I have a degree in typography. I wanted to make books. I wanted to make beautiful books, beautiful things out of type. Um, I still like to do that, so I started my own publishing company to do that totally selfishly. I was like, oh, I'm a web designer. I, I wanted to make books. So what happened was that I, I uh, speak up a few conferences and I've been blogging for a long time and around about six or seven years ago, um, a bunch of publishers were like trying to find people to write web design books because it was quite profitable at the time. Now, I don't know if you've ever read a web design book or ever looked at one. Uh, they're horrific. They look awful. And I was like, I don't want to... I don't, I don't want to write a book and somebody else do a terrible job on it and it be printed on toilet paper. I was like, no, nah, no, I don't want to do that. I'm, I'm going to do my own. So I wrote the book. It took three years to write a book and then I self-published it. Uh, and it was quite successful and other people then wanted me to publish books. So we're like, well, I don't know nothing about publishing. <coughs> How much? So uh, a lot of research and Talking to people and things like that, it turns out that the publishing industry is completely broken, uh, especially for authors. Authors get screwed over left and right. So we were like, well, that's not fair. So um, we now uh, publish mostly electronic books, actually, because it doesn't make sense publishing web design topics on paper because the web moves too fast. So uh, by the time you've gone through the process in the print run, uh, you know, you've got all this stock and it's going to be out of date in probably less than a year. So you need to make sure that you're going to sell it all and print's really expensive and it's expensive to ship because we like making nice heavy books and it costs 20 quid to ship them to the US, which is ridiculous. That's another thing that's broken, postal industry. So uh, it's kind of a startup, but it's more like an accident. I didn't really intend to do, to do it. I just wanted to make my own beautiful book and then other people wanted to do it as well. So that's, that's five simple steps, and I, I run that as, as well as the, the design studio. So these are, the, that's just a bit of background. The, these are my, this is my handbook. These are the, a few things. The first one is the web. Um, the, the thing about working on the web is that for a long time we've been trying to make the web something else. We've been trying to make it broadcasting, or we've been trying to make it print, or we've been trying to make it... Uh, some other media, some other way of, of, of telling stories, telling brand stories, um, making you buy stuff. And the, the great thing about the web, and we're only just really getting to this point, is that it's own thing. And, it, and one thing about understanding the web is really understanding its roots, right? Where it came from and why and how. So it was developed and it was designed by Tim Berners-Lee and CERN, and it was designed to facilitate the sharing of a lot of documentation. They were designing the LHC at the time, and there was going to be loads of data and loads of stuff that came out of the LHC that people would need to collaborate on. And they just needed, you couldn't do this with memos, right? This needed some kind of system. Interestingly, one thing that has died that was designed to be part of the web really early on, but it never really worked, is that the web was a read-write system when it was first developed. It wasn't just a read system, which is what we have now. So the, the idea was that you could go to a website or a web document and edit it. You know, it was permissions-based, kind of like Wikipedia, actually. Wikipedia is probably the closest to the original web idea that we have now. There's another thing that's really interesting about uh, the web, is that uh, we have no material cost. So if you're working on the web, pixels don't cost anything. The cost is moving them around. It's not like we have to order steel or, or denim from Japan or something like that. There, there is no material cost there. Uh, but that means that we can change it at any time we like. And that's a feature, not a bug. 
the, the web is, is ever-changing, and we need, to, we, we need to embrace that. So that's, one, that's the first post to note next to my desk. The next thing is, uh, well, the title of this talk, um, is that, that making things is really messy. I think we've all been sold a lie since the 50s, but I think it's kind of from advertising, certainly in the design industry, that, that design follows this linear path that is then encapsulated into some business model that's invoiced at point A, B, C, and D. Um, and the fact is that that's absolute nonsense, is my experience. It's a big, messy, horrible, sometimes, uh, process. And I have to keep telling myself that that's what it is. The moment I, I you know, Owen talked about yesterday, these, this sine wave where you, you make stuff and then you, you go and speak to people and you prototype it and you make stuff. I think there's another sine wave going along that, which is, this is great, this is rubbish, this is great, this is rubbish. And, and that's the thing, this is, this is awesome, this is totally broken and we're in a mess. How did we get here? This is, and that, that follows along every project I've worked on almost. And it's very challenging with clients because when they get to this messy bit, they're like, why are we paying you? This is a mess. We're in an absolute mess. So um, my, uh, why this is next to my desk is for when I get those uncomfortable moments when it feels terrible, is that I can say, this is just the natural state of things. This is the natural way we create stuff. It's a messy, messy process. Uh, that says talking, not hawking. <laughs> Don't be hawking. You need hawks. Um, uh, Owen also said like, loads of great nuggets yesterday uh, from him, but one of them was, was designers want to make beautiful things. And I wanted to make beautiful things. I wanted to make beautiful books. Uh, and there's a, there's a history and a legacy of design being done as, as something that you do in a shed and you do on your own in your studio. You get given a brief and you go away and you whittle away at something beautiful and you come back and go, look at my beautiful thing. Uh, that works in some instances, but I, uh, more recently I've been um, talking about the process and the mess as much as I can with clients and to the community that I'm part of uh, as a way of, you know, just learning from each other. So that's one thing is, is how we got to work with CERN. So CERN is a big, for those of you who don't know, CERN's the, the particle physics laboratory in Switzerland with the LHC, the Large Hadron Collider. Watch how you spell that. Um, they, uh, mm, um, the, uh, that's thrown me. Um, LAUGHTER <laughs> uh, so, uh, but they are a collaboration, right? They're a precursor to the EU. What happened was that all these nuclear physicists were hanging around after the World War II, you know, and they're like, somebody thought that might be a bad idea. Let's get them all together and put them in Switzerland and let them work on, you know, nerdy stuff, not blowing things up. Um, and they, they, they have to collaborate. It's a collaboration. That's what they do. So for a designer to go in there and do the normal designy thing, the normal design process, wouldn't work. It just would not work. These are scientists who need to understand your methodology. They need to understand where you're coming from, what your rationale is, why. Uh, so we spend, I spend most of my time doing this now with clients. I do very little sort of pushing pixels around, which is sometimes quite sad, but I do a lot of talking. So when you're, uh, when you're working in your groups later, um, you know, we heard it last night, the cross-pollination and talking. Already I'm seeing, I'm kind of, I'm part of Team Orange. Team Orange. Yay. Uh, <laughs> Ooh, yeah. Well, then this is my point, right? Already we're seeing competition. We're seeing, uh, I'm not going to tell you what, what we're thinking. Um, that's really bad because we don't really learn from each other. We don't really, you know, we're all in one big tent together. Um, so always be talking. But no one has shut up. And this one thing is, is uh, I, I'm really bad at this. Um, you need to be able to uh, know when to, uh, well, appropriately, know when to keep quiet. Um, this works, so if you're talking about a website or a web service or a web product, you know, what works for Flickr or Moo or Innocent or, you know, uh, that works very well for them. It doesn't work for everybody. Um, you know, if you're, 
If you're cute and it's not appropriate, just shut up. Uh, get out of my way. Know when to get out of my way. Know when to sell to me. Know when not to sell to me. I think that's the most important thing. Uh, you know, we've all been spammed. We're all repeatedly spammed. We all get asked to sign into things with Facebook. I don't want to sign into things with Facebook. Facebook knows too much about me already. Um, so there's no when to get out of the way. <laughs> Watch real people. So we talked about the entrepreneurial spirit a little bit yesterday. A bit that entrepreneurs have got this real sense of, um, of hunch, what is right. Um, and my experience is that, that that is sometimes at the detriment of proximity to their, to their customers, to their audience. So I, um, a long time ago, I, uh, I was doing some usability studies with a paper merchant. <laughs> it was such a rubbish project. It was, on a, it was a paper merchant site where mer pa people who buy paper go on and trade paper. Yeah, it wasn't terribly exciting. But um, we were, were designing the interface, and we wanted to know a few things about, oh, OK, how, how are people actually going to do this trading? So we, we had uh, some reps come in, these, these paper merchant reps sit. And we watched them use what we designed. And it's amazing how many people don't do that. Uh, so we sat down and watched it, and we're like, right, we were focusing on this little flow. Uh, and the guy who's, I don't know, who's quite an old guy, um, he, he picked up the mouse and he put the mouse on the screen. And started moving the mouse around on the screen. And we were just like, well, at first it was quite comical. We were like, this, this guy, what an idiot. And, and then we were like, well, actually, no, that this is a much bigger problem. You know, we're focused on this little thing, and the guy doesn't know how to use a computer. So we thought, well, maybe it's just this one bloke. But it turned out to be, you know, quite a few of these people were just not comfortable using a computer. That's a much bigger problem than we thought we had. So that would be one thing that I'd, I'd like to see people doing over the next couple of days, is actually speaking to some real people that represent your audience. For Team Orange, I want to I speak to some kids, right? And, and show them this thing. The next thing is MVP. Most of you probably know this term, minimal viable product. The, the, there is such a desire to create something perfect the first time. And I'm, I'm guilty of it myself. I want to whittle away in the shed, making something beautiful, when really, what, you, what I should be doing is getting it out there, testing it, getting feedback, changing it, iterating it, not whittling away on something beautiful and useless. Uh, so that's why that's you know, very important for me. Don't hide from content. Uh, it is the thing. It, it is the thing. Uh, the, the, so many clients that I've worked with who go, oh, that's somebody else's problem. That's the content person. Uh, they'll deal with that. That's the marketing department, uh, they'll deal with that. And what they're doing is just kind of shoveling it into this content mountain at the end of the project that somebody's going to have to climb over. If you've got great content, uh, it makes things so much easier. If you've got somebody who's focused on the content, it makes everything a dream. Um, so don't hide from it. Bake it in right from day one, right from later today, who's working on the content. Uh, every device everywhere. The web, there, were, there was once a time when we knew where the web was. It was on the desktop, and it was 640 pixels wide and 480 pixels deep. We knew that, and that was great. Uh, we had browser problems, but eh, you know that's fine. Now the web is everywhere, from soon to be a watch to your to tablets to your fridge to your TV. It's it's everywhere, and. Rather than splintering off and say, OK, yeah, well, it's easier if we just design an iPad app, because that's knowable. We know what that is. That's not the web. That's an iPad app. Uh, the web is everywhere. It's everything. It's one web. And the last point is do less. Uh, this is probably the, the, the kind of design principle I come back to time and time and time and time again, mostly because I've just made so many mistakes around this, the biggest one being the fulfillment for our books. When we did the fulfillment uh, for the for the ebooks and the physical books, uh, we did it all ourselves. It was stupid. We made a system which talked to the royalty software. We made our own royalty software for the authors. We did this thing and that thing, and it was just rubbish. Uh, so now we have Shopify, which talks to Shipwire, and Shipwire do the fulfillment in three warehouses around the world, um, and it costs twenty dollars a month. It's ridiculously cheap. Uh, so 
where there are other services available to build your products and, 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 and services, then use them. Don't try and reinvent the wheel to, to, to have some kind of control over that process. Um, and with that, I am out of time. So thank you very much. Thank you.